Shall we come before the Lord in prayer? Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life that thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. On a slightly uh, lighter uh, sort of track this morning, or less demanding, uh, I wish to try to take up uh, what we have been saying thus far and to repeat some of it, but to apply it uh, in reference to a very common error that is prevalent in the church today and which present truth has combated in different ways on a number of occasions. And this is the relationship between the gospel and the regeneration of the believer or the gospel and the new birth. And uh, as we look at the gospel and the new birth, I hope that we will not only be able to apply our framework, such as it has been, to a topic such as this, but that we will be encouraged in a refreshed sort of insight uh, into the gospel of our Lord, uh, into the gospel of our Lord and uh, its relation to the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit in each of our hearts. Now, as I've mentioned, the prevalent or one of the prevalent tendencies today in the church is to ground our acceptance with God on the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. It is quite common and quite popular in evangelical circles today, this grounding acceptance with God on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And as you will remember from the Present Truth magazines, we couldn't say this a few years ago, but we have to say it now because some of you are quite conversant in present truth literature. You will have remember that we've done our sort of uh, diagram and our thing on what we called number one and number two, that infamous question, on what basis does God accept a man, uh, for, for which question we were driven out of this state and that state and barely escaped with our lives. Um, but it did act as quite a helpful didactic tool, despite the fact that we ran horribly close to assassination on a number of occasions. Many a time did I pull Brinsmead out of a dark lane in Chicago, you know, <laughs> all messed up and bloodied around the head, you know, because he dared to uh, bring this number one and number two uh, perspective. In the New Testament, let's revise a bit of it. Recapitulation is the secret of success, one of my old professors used to say. So let's revise a bit of it. There are two great foci in the New Testament. The first focus is the work of God in Christ for us. The work of God in Christ for us. That's the first focus. The other great focus is the work of God by His Holy Spirit in us. The work of God by His Holy Spirit in us. They're the two great foci in the New Testament. And uh, it's helpful to keep these two foci clearly distinguished in our mind. Now, understanding. We will see that grounding our acceptance with God in the regenerative activity of the Holy Spirit is to confuse very badly these two foci. Now, the first foci, focus <coughs> deals with a finished work. And uh, this focus here is, of course 
an unfinished work. <clears throat> it's unfinished. None of us is in the position where we have been rounded off by the Spirit. None of you look in a glorified state, so though some of you approximate to being glorious. So it's an unfinished work. You are still having rough edges knocked off you, and so am I. And sometimes we rub each other's rough edges off. This work here is a perfect work, of course. And this one here is, um, if I say imperfect, you'll understand that I'm not sort of uh, deriding the work of the Spirit, but simply saying that there is not a trace of perfection in any of us. So whatever the operation of the Holy Spirit is in our being, uh, he is not producing little sort of uh, internal droplets of perfection, is he? No. Thank you. This, word, he, this work here is, of course, external. And this word, needless to say, this work, needless to say, is internal. And we could go on, right down the list, concerning uh, the difference between these two works. But this is two, the, the two great foci in the New Testament. We need to keep clear. If we designate that number one, and this one here, number two, we say that what we're talking about this morning in our Trinitarian framework will be at least in part, the relationship between number one and number two uh, of this dimension. Having sort of reminded ourselves of that twofold focus in the New Testament, or that two foci, now let's just remind ourselves of the involvement of Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the great work of salvation. Turn with me, please. Let's do this fairly rapidly to Matthew 28, verse 19. Um, while we're looking this up, Rosemary Taylor, our practical nurse, may not mind looking up John 3.16 for us, and um, perhaps um, uh, Joe mightn't mind looking up uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, Please, Joe. So Matthew 28, 19, you can take the text down. Rosemary will look up John 3, 16. And Joe will look up 2 Corinthians 5, 21. In addition to those texts, you might like to put down Ephesians 1, 3, 4 and 5. Ephesians 1, 3, 4 and 5. And 1 John 4, 14. So that's Matthew 28, 19, John 3, 16, Ephesians 1, 3, 4 and 5, 1 John 4, 14 and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. All those texts will point us to the distinctive operation, as it were, of the Father within the Trinity for our salvation. Now, Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There you have baptism into the triunity of God, or baptism into the triune name. You remember, of course, another text that talks about the Trinity's involvement in our salvation um, in that verse that we usually call the grace, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. I'm sure you remember it, but let's, let me just uh, refresh our mind here. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, I might just mention there, Joe, that this is one of the verses um, that I think is quite supportive of my contention that so often in the New Testament, when we see um, God mentioned in juxtaposition to Christ, it means the Father. And this verse, I think, is quite clearly that the grace of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and the love of God, obviously meaning Father, you see, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, the Trinitarian text. 
Now, there are texts, numerous texts again, which speak of the role of the Spirit. And I'll give them to you and we'll select a couple. Perhaps uh, Marilyn would read Ephesians 1, 14 and 17 for us, please. And Tim, John 15, 26. Here they are quickly. 15, 26 of John. 16, 14 of John. 1 John 5, 6. John 15, 18 and 19. And Ephesians 1, 14 and 17. A representative corpus of texts which speak of the role of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is spoken of as our earnest or our, our rabbon, our down payment in Ephesians 1.14 and he is spoken of as the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in Ephesians 1.17. Now, having looked briefly at some of those representative texts of Father, Son and Holy Spirit's involvement in our salvation, let's draw a few conclusions from them, shall we? First of all, there is a real distinction between Father and Son and Holy Spirit in the Bible. There is a real distinction between Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the Bible. Things that are revealed of one are, strictly speaking, notice that qualification, strictly speaking, not applicable of the other. Things revealed of one, not applicable of the other. Or others. Now you need to keep my statement about the imputation or the communication of attributes perspective in remembering that because I'm going to show you some texts in a moment where things that are strictly the work of one are said to be the work of the other by virtue of this union that exists. So that's the first conclusion. There is a real distinction and strictly speaking things revealed of one are not applicable uh, of others. Second conclusion. There is plainly different offices, as it were, different offices under the one plan of grace. Each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, execute different parts in the one work of salvation. And the third conclusion is, we must honour the distinction that the Word of God gives to us, otherwise we shall be involved in inextricable confusion. We will have a Christianity that sounds like this. Before the world began, Father, Son and Holy Spirit met together and the Holy Spirit decided to send the Father to be born of a virgin. The Holy Spirit came to earth and lived a perfect life for us. There are a few high points here. There is the baptism of the Father at the Jordan, for instance, the transfiguration of the Spirit, and then the crucifixion of the Holy Spirit. But we have good news. The resurrection of the Father followed, and He went to the right hand of the Son, and the Holy Spirit baptized the church with the Son, and we look forward to the Father's return. You do get some idea that that's quite different from the biblical revelation. And yet, this is the point, brothers and sisters, it is only pushing to a little bit more absurd end the implicit confusion that lies in a lot of our evangelistic talk and our talk within the evangelical church. Now, when we confuse 1 and 2, that I mentioned and wrote on the uh, screen for us, when we confuse the work of God for us and the work of God in us, we do exactly the same thing as I was uh, just uh, saying to you about confusing you know, the works of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. When we ground our acceptance with God in the regenerating internal work of the Holy Spirit, we do just as serious a confusion of things as I was just outlining for you there. So there we've seen the involvement of the Trinity in our one salvation, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we've deduced certain conclusions from it. Now, second thing. The work of the Holy Spirit is as necessary for our justification as the work of the Son. Please note, the work of the Holy Spirit is as necessary for our justification as the work of the Son. 
However, the work of the Holy Spirit is as necessary for our salvation, or our justification rather, as the work of the Son, but, it's, but it is not necessary, his role that is, or his work, it is not necessary for the same reasons, nor is it effectual for the same end. The work of the Holy Spirit is as necessary for our justification, I'm not saying salvation, I'm saying justification, it is as necessary for our justification as the work of the Son. However, it is not necessary for the same reasons or nor is it effectual for the same ends. Let's look now at some passages which show us the necessity of the work of the Spirit. I'll give them to you and we may look at one or so of them. There is John chapter 3, verses 3, 5 and 6. This is the passage, of course, that speaks about it is necessary to be born again. It is necessary to be born of the Spirit and of water, of water and of the Spirit. John 3, 3, 5 and 6. Perhaps um, Wayne will look up for us Romans 8, 9. So we have John 3, 3, 5 and 6, Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. That's a negative statement. No man calls Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Positively said, the Holy Spirit is necessary if we're going to call Jesus Lord. And of course, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. John 3, 3, 5, 6. Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, and 1 Corinthians 1, 30. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Romans 8, 9, thank you, Wayne. That text says plainly that if we do not have the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell us, we are not Christians. So you see that the role of the Spirit is utterly essential for acceptance with God. Without the Spirit, there is no Christian Consciousness. There is no Christian existence. Now look at another lot of passages, but this time passages which show that the Son and the Holy Spirit are involved in the same work. The first lot of passages, under this heading of the necessity of the work of the Spirit for our justification, the first lot of passages show us the necessity of the Spirit's work, representative text. Now, this lot of passages show us that the Son and the Spirit are connected in the same work. And the first passage is 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And that is what some of you were, says Paul. Now, listen to it carefully. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So you see that justification there is attributed to the Spirit as well as to the Son. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. There's a passage which shows clearly the, the, uh, the fact that the Spirit and the Son are connected in the same work. Justification is attributed to both Spirit and Son. Now, another interesting passage along this line is Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Let's read from verse 3, shall we? At one time we too were foolish. Notice, by the way, the similarity of this passage and the Corinthians passage we just looked at. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. And here's one of the biggest little words in the universe, but... It is a big word, that but, isn't it? I remember when I was a boy. You know, my father was a man of iron discipline. And uh, 
you know, I'm very grateful for that. I used to think he was a bit hard, but uh, many of the things that I enjoy now and much of the personal liberty in certain areas of my life that I enjoy, I owe to the strictness of my father. So, uh, fathers, don't be too lenient, you know. Well, my father used to promise me, you know, if we were out and I was misbehaving or something and it wasn't quite the right place at the right time, he would say to me, son, um, I'm going to give you, when I was a little boy, he'd say, I'm going to give you a spanking when we get home. Well, I would improve Im immensely at the party or wherever we were and I would uh, be his personal uh, valet, you know. I would be his Batman. I would carry his coat you know, help him into the car, almost steer it for him, you know. Help him out of the car like an aged woman. Nine times out of ten, my father kept to his promises unflinchingly. He was a man of his word. And all sorts of devious generosities on my part could not uh, do that. You know, I mean, my mother used to say, you're a very naughty boy. I'm going to ring your father up and tell him how naughty, and she would ring him up and tell him, and she would say, now when your father comes home, he is going to discipline you in no small way. Well, I'd shoot out as soon as I hear the car, and I'd help him out of the car. Let me carry your bag. Dad, I'd say, you look tired. Oh, man, you know, you're so tired, you couldn't exert yourself at all tonight, could you? You know. And he used to sit me down. It's a matter of interlude. You interested in this little interlude? He'd sit me down, and he'd say, listen, son, he'd say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. <laughs> I used to say, why, why, why hurt yourself, Dad? <laughs> Give yourself a break. <laughs> He'd say, I want you to know I'm going to do this because I love you. Ha, 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 ha. Every now and then, though, I remember one occasion very, very distinctly. He'd say, you know, son, you have been a disgustingly naughty boy. And I'd sort of, my lip would quaver, you know, and I'd say, I'd know, yeah, disgusting, yeah. He'd say, you know, you deserve to be thrashed. My lip would quaver a bit more, you know, and a little teardrop would push itself to the forefront of my eyeball. And I'd say, yeah, I, I know I should be thrashed. And he'd say, you know, I don't help you if I don't thrash you. I used to have a little ha-ha-ha-ha in my heart about that. But. <laughs> but every now and then he'd say, but, oh, what a, it was like a cool shower on a blisteringly hot day. But, he says, I want you to know that I'm going to let you off on this occasion. Now, it's important to have a father who sticks to his word, even sometimes when that sticking to his word means that uh, you've got to book your seat sort of thing. Because you can trust that. If my father said he would take me on a picnic, come rain, hail, shine. You know, I have had a picnic with my father in a shed in a park, you know, with raining cats and dogs. Because he promised me on that day he would take me on a picnic. But how beautiful was that but? And here it is in verse 4 of chapter 3 of Titus. But, but, you know, we were hating and being hated. But, now notice this, when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared. Notice that. It seems fairly obvious in this passage, let me just interpose at this point, that, that God here is the Father... But notice that God, i.e. Father, is called our Saviour. But when the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us, I say, through the washing of rebirth. He saved us by baptism. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, second thoughts in the lud. <laughs> Better not do that. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. Fancy that. Most Christians suffer mental epilepsy today if you say I was saved by baptism. 
But there Paul says it. We shouldn't be wiser than the apostle. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. There, we're saved by baptism and the inner renewing of the Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. There's little doubt in the passage that having been justified by his grace refers to that order that he has already mentioned there, you see. Saved by the washing of rebirth, renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Now that's a little jumbled according to our set theories of the order of salvation, the way we like to have things. But my point is this. There are passages in the New Testament which show the necessity of the operation of the Holy Spirit for justification and for acceptance. That was the first lot of passages we looked at. But there are also passages which show how that the Spirit and Son are connected in the same work. Regeneration, or justification rather, is attributed in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, to the Spirit and the Son, to the Son and the Spirit. And here, Paul says we're saved by the new birth. We're saved by the washing of rebirth and uh, by the internal work of the Spirit. Strictly speaking, this is my point, strictly speaking, we're not saved on the ground or we're not saved by regeneration or by baptism, strictly speaking, but by virtue of, this is the point, you see, by virtue of the union of the Son and the Spirit and the Father, by virtue of the union of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you can attribute to one person what in actual fact belongs to another person. You can call God the Father our Saviour when strictly speaking you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. You can attribute the work of justification to the Spirit and you can attribute the work of renewing to the Son by virtue of the union of the two. Now that is an interesting phenomenon to mark. And it's only as we understand the framework, as it were, that we will not do what the Church of Rome has done and so many in the Evangelical Church. And that is to latch on, as it were, to passages such as that and to maintain a justification on the ground of regeneration. You see, that's the great error. It's like latching on to God being called Saviour, the Father being called Saviour, and propounding that we're saved by the work of the Father to such an emphasis that we neglect the other aspects. So, what have we said thus far? Well, we've looked at Trinitarian passages in the New Testament, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We have made certain deductions from them. There is a distinction of office in the one work of salvation, etc. Then we have said that the work of the Spirit is as necessary for our justification as the work of the Son. However, Necessary not for the same reasons or for the same or effectual for the same ends. We have looked at the unity of Christ and the Spirit. We have seen passages which show us the necessity of the role of the Spirit for our acceptance with God. And we've looked at passages which show us the connection of the Son and the Spirit in the same work. So that because of the union of the two, you may refer to one what in actual fact belongs to the other. Um, I make two conclusions out of that data now. First, any doctrine which excludes the operation of the Holy Spirit for justification is as bad as that which makes justification depend on the work of the Spirit. Please note, any doctrine that excludes the work of the Spirit for our justification is as bad as that which makes our justification depend on the role of the Spirit. And I think that the conclusion of the biblical data is this. There is no justification apart from the Spirit and there is no justification on the ground of the Spirit. 